Hi, everyone. Welcome. We'll get started in just a minute. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Carr, and I am the uh, Chief Knowledge Broker at Octo, Open Communications for the Ocean. And we are very pleased to welcome everyone here today, and particularly Allison Catalano, our speaker. Uh, Allison is currently the Evidence and Learning Manager at Sequoia Climate Fund. Um, and she did, conducted the work that she's gonna be speaking on today uh, while at Imperial College London as part of her PhD dissertation. Um, She's going to be speaking about learning from failure and conservation, which is a great topic we all need to think more about. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to let you know, we, um, you can ask questions in many ways. We'll save, um, we have time allocated at the end for a dedicated question and answer session. Um, but we encourage you to send in thoughts and comments and questions along the way. There's two ways you can do that. You can send it in through the question and answer panel and those will go directly, Allison and I can see those, um, but the rest of the um, attendees cannot. Um, or you could use the chat um, and then you have options. You can send it to just, um, just me, Allison and I, uh, or everyone, you can share with everyone. And we do actually encourage you to share your thoughts and comments, um, keep it relevant and on topic, uh, but with everyone in the chat, because there's, there's rich discussions to be had there. So feel free to do that, um, to be discussing learning from failure and conservation uh, while we talk in reaction to things Allison said, as, as well as ideas. Um, well, thank you, Allison, for being here. Um, I'll turn it over to your, you, and we appreciate you doing this. It's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Sarah. And um, thank you all for joining today. I'm pleased to be talking about failure, which sounds really weird, but that's what I've been doing for the last five years or so. Um, as Sarah said, I recently finished my PhD um, in organizational learning with a particular focus on learning from failure in conservation initiatives. And i um, very glad to be sharing some of this with you this morning and hopefully um, encouraging some good discussions both today and of course, as you go back to work and mull over some of the things that we've talked about and hopefully talk about it with your um, colleagues and think about how you can be more effective uh, in the face of the failure that all of us know is part of the work that we do every day. Um, just a little bit about my background. Um, I started my PhD program having had a rather crooked path. Um, I was in the Navy. Uh, I did a Wharton Business School MBA. I spent some time as a strategy consultant for Bain and Company in London, and I worked for the US ambassador in Ankara, Turkey for several years. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm now working in um, a climate fund, uh, working on uh, climate mitigation work, which I'm uh, really enjoying, and I'm very glad to be here today with you. So let's jump right in. Um, and before we start talking about failure, I do want to just say that we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that success has real value. That's kind of obvious. Some of the things I've learned in my research so far are pretty obvious. Success is foundational. It's a critical component of progress. It feels good. It motivates performance. It generates professional and financial rewards. Standards and checklists help us uh, keep us from making routine errors. Best practices originated to institutionalize what are good practices throughout an organization. So it's good to focus on what is working so that we can be more efficient. And it does eliminate the need to look for other alternatives, which we'll come back to. Uh, this is where the, of course, the idea of it ain't broke, don't fix it comes from. But uh, identifying what went right is often the low-hanging fruit. It's kind of the easier way to do things. Um, relying on success actually has some important limitations. It is hard to get people to do things differently when the current way is working well, so people can become complacent. 
we get overconfident. Success sends a signal that we don't need to change. We're doing everything right. We don't really need to keep learning. We don't pursue new ideas and we maintain the status quo. There's no real signal that you need to try anything new. Importantly, when we use only success to drive our lessons learned, we risk oversampling success and undersampling failure. So we end up with biased interpretations of outcomes and really questionable causal factors. And then finally, we risk, there's this sort of inherent risk asymmetry in organizations. And this means that individuals tend to be risk averse because blame often flows to those who try and fail rather than those who fail to act. So oftentimes the really important stuff is what we did wrong because it will keep tripping us up if we don't examine it and try to figure it out. I'll give you a small example. Uh, fighter pilots in the military go out and fly and they come back and do a debrief and they use the 80-20 rule. They spend 80% of their time talking about what went wrong. What they did right is only useful to, to generate and codify a standard of practice or best practices. As we discussed, this is important but it's very different than setting up a debrief to learn from failure. So we need to figure out what's, what could be tripping us up? What do we need to be doing differently? And success can't really tell us that. So failure is actually really useful. It's a big stop sign that tells us, hey, look here, my paradigm, I need to rethink my paradigm. Failure has higher informational value than success. For example, a small win could be good news, it's a win, or bad news, it's not a very big win. And it's tricky to determine what actually caused the win. Was it luck, the team, the funding level, stakeholder commitment, the regulatory landscape? Failure unequivocally says, there's a problem here that needs to be investigated. So in the riveting words of academic writing, two organizational learning researchers who study success and failure said it, I think very effectively, even though it's kind of boring, Performance improvements should be treated as confounded, but performance decrements as containing information. The idea of the informational value of failure is captured nicely by the science philosopher Karl Popper, who used uh, what's known as the black swan fallacy to discuss the importance of falsifiability. If we want to test the hypothesis that all swans are white, continuing to find white swans does nothing to prove this claim. Only finding a black swan, a failure of the hypothesis, will do the trick. So success can only tell us so much. We need the falsifying power of failure, its ability to signal to us, to tell us the other half of the story. So I discovered as I started my research program that organizational learning has been defined in various ways in the literature, but the fundamental building block of all of them is the management of errors. So learning essentially means being able to learn from failure. You will all have seen cycles like this in many process diagrams, including adaptive management. It's all about uncovering errors and being able to correct them and ultimately learn from them and get ready for the next iteration. In order to understand uh, a little bit more about how we think about learning from failure and conservation, I started looking at how failure is viewed in some other disciplines that have been thinking about this stuff and trying to come up with frameworks to tackle this a lot longer than we have in conservation. So business turns out, aviation, medicine, uh, all of these fields have done quite a lot of thinking about learning from failure. It's really not hard to find a lot written about this subject outside of conservation. I'll just highlight a few key ideas um, that I wrote about in a paper in 2017. In her extensive work with CEOs and managers, a Harvard professor, Dr. Amy Edmondson, created a very helpful spectrum as a way to think about failure that highlights one of the major problems that we have to confront, blame. In this model, outcomes are understood to be positioned along a spectrum so that fault and failure are no longer conflated. The ultimate goal here is to put blame in its appropriate place and remove fear from the discussion so that real problem solving can take place. The medical world had a seismic shock with the publications of the Institute, uh, with the publication of the Institutes of Medicine report in 1999. Much like many individual failures in conservation, the impact of failures in hospitals tends to be kind of dispersed through the population, so it's hard to get a sense of the scale of the problem. This report, really for the first time, brought it all together and started a slow revolution in healthcare 
because for the first time people really saw that the scale of the problem was essentially akin to three jumbo jets crashing every single day. The problems they found were a system that was characterized by ingrained hierarchy and a fear of speaking up, as well as a fear of blame and a lack of non-punitive reporting systems. There's a lot of literature in medicine about applying lessons from aviation to help address the problem of learning from failure. Medicine really uses aviation in a lot of ways as its benchmark, and we're gonna take a little look at why. The next few slides are used at the new hire training at United Airlines. Um, I'm presenting them to you so that you can see how rigorously this discipline approaches this problem. So this dramatic red line shows the reduction in accidents in the worldwide commercial jet fleet. With one important exception that we're gonna talk about shortly, all of these safety improvements that you see here are technological improvements. They're really trying to squeeze out every last bit of the system causes for failure. Let's look at some of these, um, and you can see here some of the system improvements that they have um, uh, tackled. So we're gonna zoom in on the most recent years here and see that our current error rate is actually extremely low, statistically almost zero. But it's not zero, and zero accidents is the goal, so they realize that we still have work to do. So when you're sitting, imagine yourself now sitting in the new hire class at United Airlines, and you're all A-type, highly skilled, highly trained aviators, typically you'll have thousands of hours already under your belts before you finally make it to the big leagues. And what, we're, what you're being told is that even though accidents are almost at zero, it's still not good enough. And the problem is you. So this is not about blame. This is about research. Technology and systems improvements have removed almost all of the system causes of errors. Now the most common causal factor in this tiny fraction of accidents that do happen is pilot error. So now they look at this very objectively and say, okay, we need to put processes in place to address this final cause of error that's not due to how the airplane functions, but how humans functions. So the reason that aviation, of course, has set the gold standard in creating these systems and mindsets that learn from failure is because of a series of accidents that happened in the 70s and 80s. Uh, just one example here, this flight 173 outside Portland, Oregon, the plane actually ran out of gas and crashed while the crew remained focused on a faulty landing gear light, which they thought meant the landing gear wasn't down, but in fact, it was the light bulb that was burned out. There was nothing wrong with the landing gear at all. This was, of course, a major loss of situational awareness. The co-pilot didn't challenge the captain, the, uh, the captain, and there was no crew coordination. This was down to human error. So because of this accident and others like it, United and other airlines uh, adopted what's called crew resource management, specifically recognizing that because human error is inevitable, pilots need to be taught specific skills to recover from these errors. So these highly technically trained people needed an additional set of skills to perform their jobs effectively and achieve their goal of continuously learning to better recover from errors so they can prevent accidents. This training that they put all of the pilots through includes things like cognitive biases, psychological safety, even comprehensive personality style assessments. The airlines have put in systems like extensive non-punitive reporting mechanisms, and they couple these systems with training to develop mindsets so that the humans in the cockpit can cope with the inevitability of error and effectively learn from failure. So what I'm trying to drive to here is that none of this talk should make anyone feel negative. If anything, we think of it as an opportunity to expand our skill set and find new ways to approach our work. So like pilots and doctors and other highly skilled people, we all have skill sets that have been honed over years of experience and training. Also, like these other highly technically trained people, there are additional skills that can help us perform better and have nothing to do with our specific technical proficiency. These are things like leadership, teamwork, project management, and as these other disciplines increasingly recognize, a whole host of psychological and behavioral traits that impact our ability to perform to our highest level. 
particularly when dealing with conflict and learning from failure and all of the emotional baggage that comes with that. So what these other disciplines remind us is that human error is inevitable, failure is inevitable. So we just need to learn how to deal with it as productively as possible. I am not of the school that thinks that conservation is the same as other disciplines. I don't think that it would work to take their playbook and sort of jam it into our system. Some of these concepts, however, do apply. What do we do with our systems and our mindsets to improve our ability to learn from failure that we all know is inevitable in the work that we do? So during the course of my research, uh, I discovered that a lot of activities and attitudes go into the process of learning from failure and conservation. I started with synthesizing everything that we were discovering about how learning from failure is facilitated. Uh, it starts with the cycle of identification and flows through analysis and correction, and then institutionalization of the learning. We envision sort of all of the elements that need to be in place to enable effective learning from failure or what we might call intelligent failure. The first dimension is our individual mindset or how we think about failure. It's our mental model, it's our emotional reactions. Do I see failure as an opportunity or something to avoid? Each of us has our own history and our own willingness to confront failure. These beliefs are what we might call our individual failure orientation. Some authors call this our error orientation or our growth versus our fixed mindset. All of these ideas really represent the same thing, which is what is my response when I'm confronted with failure? Do I see it as a learning opportunity or do I try to avoid that circumstance? The second piece in the thinking dimension is how the group views failure. What is the team's or the organization's mental model? How does the leader view failure or respond to failure when it happens? Does the team exhibit psychological safety? Is there a culture of blame uh, implicit or explicit in the team or the organization? The second dimension um, is what I call the doing or the activities or the systems, the processes that encourage learning from failure. On the individual level, this could include an individual's willingness to identify and surface errors, their willingness to engage in reflection and seek and share feedback, as well as engage in robust data gathering activities. And then finally, at the group level, these activities or systems could include the systems in place to ensure knowledge transfer, data collection, storage, retrieval of information. This group level is also where a culture of experimentation can be encouraged or, or discouraged, and where we either incentivize or not documenting learning and sharing the learning and holding people accountable for participating in learning processes. Of course, all of this only works if the leadership buys into this um, process of learning from failure themselves. While we're in this sort of big picture mode, um, I've run across a couple of different ways of thinking about this that I wanted to share with you. Um, we are wrong about things all the time. Our models are imperfect, no matter the level of expertise that we have. We're wrong about lots of things every day. I like to think of this as our goal is to be less wrong over time by taking in new information and wanting to hear feedback and adapting. That is the key to learning. So we need to think about what does it mean to be wrong? Is it really a failure? Is it something wrong with me? That's often why we're reluctant to face failure. Uh, some frequent advice that we might hear is, it's okay to say you're wrong, let's, let's celebrate failure, but it's, it still makes it sound like we screwed up. The premise there is still that we screwed up somehow. In reality, we all have imperfect models of the world. So we're gonna be wrong a lot, especially in complex fields like conservation, climate change mitigation, and many other places that we're working. This is not a screw up. Just because you screwed something up doesn't mean you failed. You don't need to feel guilty. It doesn't have to be a big deal. The way that Daniel Kahneman, Nobel Prize winner in psychology thinks about it is, this is a good thing because we are less wrong than we were before the event happened. The real failure is whether or not I accept the new information and become less wrong over time. So to sum it up, to be more right over time, you have to be willing to be 
wrong in any given case. Another way to think about this is our mindsets. You may have heard of Carol Dweck's growth versus fixed mindset. Here's another metaphor that you might that might appeal to you. Um, we it's often not a lack of knowledge. It might be a motivation to see things clearly. It's not very natural to uh, prove that we are um, able to understand the failure that happened and examine the failure in detail. Our motivation, on the other hand, is often to prove that we were right, prove that we're not weak, prove that we're smart. People often act like what we would call soldiers. Soldiers approach the situation by defending their beliefs, shooting down other conflicting information, seeing alternatives as, as the enemy. You might hear militaristic sort of language like unshakable beliefs, opposing arguments, shooting down an argument. For a soldier in this mindset, you're changing your mind is seen as a weakness or even a defeat. Often we ourselves are in this sort of soldier mindset and we're very reluctant to examine our beliefs. I would invite you to think more like a scout. Scout mindset is being driven by the desire to find the truth, to form an accurate map of the territory. It's not a threat to your beliefs when you come across information that doesn't jibe with what you thought. It's just that more or less information can make your map more or less accurate. A scout would perceive changing one's mind as something positive, something that's part of a continuous learning process. So while the soldier mindset might be made based on natural human emotions, uh, such as defensiveness or tribalism, a scout mindset is, uh, enables someone to enjoy learning new things, be more of a pioneer, be more exploratory. So do I defend my point of view and stick to my decision because I'm convinced that I'm right? Or do I listen to other opinions, even if they're contradictory to mine, and try to understand where they're coming from to try to get a more complete picture of what's going on. So I wanna leave you with a couple of principles for how we might apply this in our own professional lives. I think first, it's important for us to acknowledge that failure is inevitable. Learning, however, is not inevitable. We work in complex systems. We know we're gonna have failure. Instead of ignoring it or denying it, it's better to reframe our thinking and practice into a learning approach to failure. The context of high uncertainty that we're all operating in means that we can never stop learning. Rather than, again, focusing on being right in any given case, we should focus on being less wrong over time and view our work as a learning journey. The mindsets and behaviors that are necessary for learning from failure may be counterintuitive and they often require that we go against the grain. We may feel that we're really sticking our necks out there. For us to view mistakes or failure, or even things that just didn't go right as essential opportunities for learning, we really need leaders to model these behaviors and create psychological safety in our teams and work groups. We need to set and sustain social norms of tolerance for error, open inquisitiveness, requirement for reflection, and an intolerance for blame. While individuals need the right mindset to learn from failure, our work really happens in teams. Informal, they might be informal work groups uh, that span projects, geographies, or cultures, or it might be a more defined team that you've worked with for years. These interpersonal processes are where the learning is really enabled or discouraged. I encourage everyone to make time for this iterative process of action, reflection, integration of knowledge, and ongoing course correction. It can be challenging to adopt a problem-solving approach to failure, and we often censor ourselves because we don't want to feel dumb, or we're not really sure how we're going to be received by the group. Many, the overwhelming majority of the conservationists that I interviewed and surveyed during the course of this work do not feel that they have time for reflection, or they perceive that their workplace really rewards busyness. So action is prioritized over reflection. If there's one thing that I would encourage you to take away from today's discussion, it's the importance of the activity of reflection. This is what we might call closing the learning loop. It's integrating our shared mental models so we have a more 
accurate picture of the world. We, again, uh, operate in environments of high uncertainty, so we don't often know what effect our actions are going to have. Setting aside some time for this deliberate activity of examining our assumptions, reflecting on our key decision points, thinking about where our theory of change didn't match what happened on the ground, these are all part of effective learning from failure. So I would just invite you to think about what processes are already in place in your organization that you can build on. Is there anything missing at your individual team or organizational levels that you could try out? Are there places where your learning is captured or stored or disseminated that you could build on? Are these processes specific enough or do you need to tweak them to make them more explicitly learning oriented? I would encourage everyone to take a few minutes to think about how you might apply what we've talked about today in your day-to-day -day work. Here's some examples of what other people have done to apply these ideas about intelligent failure. Um, and some people view this as sort of lighting little fires. If this is not coming from the top of your organization, you might wanna try these out with your team. And maybe the more people that are exposed to it, a cultural change can take place in your organization. So for example, you might take a few minutes at the end of every day to reflect on surprises, challenges, learnings, what you might do differently going forward. There's some interesting research from um, Professor Di Stefano. I can share that link uh, afterwards. And they did a study that encouraged people to, they split people into two groups and half the group uh, was asked to do 15 minutes of reflection at the end of the day, and the other group was not. The group that was uh, encouraged to do the 15 minutes of reflection performed better on cognitive assessment tests. 23% um, better, I think was the exact number. And there's many other studies that support the uh, improvement in performance outcomes um, as a consequence of engaging in reflection activities. Uh, I would invite you to ask for feedback and treat it like the gift that it really is because it's helping you learn and grow. Ask other people if they'd like your feedback in the same sort of a spirit. You might ask a friend to ask you some curious learning oriented questions um, to see if there are ways that you could have thought differently about something that didn't go as planned. I just wanna key in one more time on the first point. Time should not be a barrier to reflection try to make it part of your regular work week. Maybe starting today, plan to set aside 15 minutes on a Monday morning or a Thursday afternoon to do a, a little bit of a reflection, either individually or with some members of your team. This focus on reflection should be carried in to the organizational level. There needs to be an expectation set up uh, for some regular blameless reflection sessions that this is part of our culture, that we make this part of our operating norms. If you're in charge of an organization at any level, I encourage you to make this happen. I will just key in on the importance of organizations rewarding people who take risks. You might require people who share success stories to also share what were some of the hiccups along the way? What were the setbacks that people experienced? This will model the reality that projects rarely proceed linear from start linearly from start to success without some sort of failure, setback, hiccup along the way. You might ensure that bad news is shared as openly as good news. Maybe everything needs to include a what did we learn session as part of regular meetings. Um, I'll just uh, add one more point uh, that Google X uses, um, and this is sort of their innovation lab. When people do stand up to share their successes, they're also required to share some of their failures that happened along the way. I wanted to show you a couple of resources that you might enjoy uh, if you're interested in learning some more about this. These are all easily accessible and um, pretty straightforward in their explanations. This here is the 2011 Harvard Business Review uh, article that was entirely dedicated to this topic. And there's many resources in here um, uh, it was from April of 2011, and many of, these, many of the articles in this issue are available online. Tim Harford's book, Adapt, um, he also has a podcast. Um, 
and has written several other books on this. This is a very accessible uh, and well-researched uh, book on the topic. Here's one of Amy Edmondson's many books. Uh, she's written lots of articles. You can find all of these um, on her website at Harvard um, and of course, anywhere that you buy books. And Daniel Kahneman's work um, is pretty widely known uh, in the areas of economics. He was one of the sort of founders of behavioral economics. And I highly recommend this book as well. Adam Grant teaches at Wharton Business School and has written several books about different ways of thinking. And he touches on the concepts of learning from failure and why it's difficult psychologically to tackle. And then uh, Atul Gawande is a doctor uh, who has also written extensively on how we think about making our teams more effective, making our processes more effective so that we can tackle the inevitability of failure. So I really appreciate you all being here today and joining us. And I will end there and hand it back over to Sarah. Okay, thank you, Allison. Um, again, I'd remind everyone they can send in questions through the chat or the Q&A panel. Um, I think the first thing is a really big picture in terms of speaking specifically about conservation. How do you categorize like how how do what are the lessons learned specifically for conservation and i guess another big picture is how how are we defining success in conservation and failure in conservation uh one person pointed out in the chat that you know we're sort of lumping all failures together just sort of huge things and small things uh relatively small things that have relatively little impact versus huge uh, failures how, how, can you talk let's start there how can you how are you defining success and failure? And then like, I'd like to switch it to was like how, what specific lessons, these are general lessons, what, how would you, what specifics should conservationists take away? Before I answer that, I'm gonna go tell my son to turn the vacuum cleaner off, which is next door. Hold on one second. Understood. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> That's the reality of working from home. Um, so definitions of success and failure. I appreciate this question coming up. Um, and I will have to just share that this was something that my supervisor and I grappled with right from the start and spent days, weeks, I don't know, it felt like years uh, wrestling with just this. I eventually landed on a fairly straightforward definition, because at the end of the day, the definition was, I would say, less important than the activities around dealing with it. Um, what I mean by that is we sort of know when things haven't worked out very well, and trying to wrestle that into a definition detracts from the activities that we need to take to figure out what we need to learn. So I'm not sure if I'm explaining that well, but what we ended up on landing on was a fairly basic definition of a failure is when you didn't achieve the outcome that you were hoping for. And success is we achieved the outcome that we were hoping for. Now, I understand that that can be unpacked in multitudes of different ways. And there can be multiple sort of mini failures on the way to success. There can be multiple mini successes on the way to failure. Again, when we spend, when we spend too much time trying to categorize and say, well, was this a failure? Was this a success? We're using up energy that we could be rather exploring the different perspectives engaged in this issue. I might consider something to be a failure. Sarah might see the same situation as a success. That's a little more interesting to me than whether the thing was a failure or not. Does that, does that help make sense a little bit? 
Uh, yes, yes, yes. And I'll let people follow if they wanted to follow up on that. I'll, I'll let them send in questions. But yes, um, we had another sort of a related question. Um, thanks for sharing your insights, Allison. I'm wondering how people's conceptions of failure or success in your research hinge on how explicitly the desired outcomes were or were not articulated or defined in advance. What do you mean? Uh, how I, well. Oh, so like we said, we were going to do this thing and then we, yes. did, we didn't accomplish that thing. So yes. yeah, I would say in that, I think that the reality of the situation is that we, we don't allow enough flexibility and adaptation and we don't reflect along the way to see if our theory of change that caused us to make that outcome uh, that caused us to set that outcome as what we wanted in the first place we don't give ourselves enough flexibility within the system that we're working to recognize that we need to adapt to changing conditions that i recognize is probably an unsatisfactory answer because Oftentimes we're working, we've gotten a grant and we say, we're, we're gonna do this thing. And if we don't accomplish that thing, then we have failed at the objective that was set out in the grant. That I would imagine is not an uncommon experience that people have. I would also argue that that paradigm where there is no room for adaptability there's no room for rechecking our assumptions along the way is kind of what got us into this mess in the first place in terms of not being able to discuss with our stakeholders, our funders, other people in the community that are part of this project. What is it about that outcome that is out there that we cannot make a change in order to see that something happened and now we have to pivot. So why are we locked into this outcome that we said, even when the, the context around us has changed? I guess I would just put that out as a challenge, recognizing that that's really difficult um, and was mentioned a lot in interviews that I did with people working in the field and saying, yeah, we are held to account for this we're sort of locked into this accountability framework that is very far apart from a learning framework, for example. So I, I don't have the answers for that. I just recognize that that's a dynamic that happens in conservation. And I would just challenge everybody to challenge that framework and look for ways that we can co-create and figure out how we can be more adaptable and work with your stakeholders to say, where, how do we do a systems map and what are the interventions and different theories of action that underpin our larger theory of change and what needs to be true in order for that outcome to still be relevant and accurate. And if those things turn out not to be true, what does that mean for that ultimate outcome? So it's just a slightly different way of thinking about it that opens up some more opportunities to be ultimately more effective, I think. Does that get to it. I kind of also hate that this is not a multiple party conversation. <laughs> we'll have to uh, revisit this as a panel right? discussion too. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> um, although people are responding to things you say, but sort of in the chat I'm informally, but yeah. Enough, I think. <clears throat> we'll have to revisit <laughs> this. And if there's enthusiasm for that, uh, please let us know in the chat or, or, or sending a separate email. Um, so a, a a good question to turn it back to specifically conservation. Um, it's a really interesting presentation, Allison. Thank you. Can you think of any good examples where this is being put into practice in conservation environmental policy through obvious and public channels, such as conferences, journals? Has there been pushback or success from these endeavors? Yes, actually. Um, there is. There are several places where this is being put into practice. Um, I will be happy to share at the, um, when we're done, and I meant to pull this up and put it on a slide, but I didn't have a chance to. Um, there are a number of organizations that are being really intentional about this. Uh, 
I feel quite strongly that this is something that the philanthropic community needs to take the lead on because oftentimes NGOs feel a bit, the, the recipients of funding feel a bit locked in to the structure as it exists um, maybe traditionally where they don't really feel like they can challenge the status quo. So I feel quite strongly that funders have an important role to play here. And a number of funders are tackling this head on. Um, I would just highlight some of the work that Skoll Foundation is doing, Moore Foundation is doing, uh, a lot more Hewlett Foundation, for example, they uh, were having regular sort of fail fests, for example. Um, other funders are doing those sorts of things. And um, again, I'll share some resources afterwards for people to read some more about specific examples where people are trying to tackle this head on. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I would just offer uh, that as a resource because um, nothing's coming to mind immediately, but I know there's lots out there. <laughs> okay, thank you, Allison. Yeah, um, I, I would also mention too, for anyone who goes to the SEB meetings, the Society for Conservation Biology meetings, um, I know that in 2014, uh, there was a round table on learning from failure and conservation. 2016, I actually did a whole half day symposium on it um, and generated a lot of discussion around this topic um, and got people sort of thinking about it and talking about it. Um, and then we had another session in 2021, we did another session on it. Um, so it, it does come up in different forum, uh, various forums about, you know, needing to be better about talking about this. A number of papers have come out recently where people are trying to tackle this topic. And, I, and the, um, the journal Conservation Science and Practice, for example, um, is specifically committed to publishing um, papers that identify, you know, that try to break away from that mold of only publishing successful outcomes. They specifically are asking for papers where people say, this didn't work out, here's why, and we'd like to share this with the wider academic community. Um, and they're trying to bridge between academic and practitioner communities. I know I've read a fair bit in more practice oriented journals like Kudu and Oryx, for example. Um, and then of course, um, in the publicly available non-peer reviewed literature, there's increasingly um, blogs and white papers and reports being written about exactly this topic. So I do think that it is being raised up to a level that the wider community is talking about it more. And I think that that's an important component of starting to shift the culture more broadly. Okay, thank you. And I think that helps address the question we had gotten about um, funders and donors sort of being not wanting to fund things that are not assured of success. Um, hey, John Fisher's in the audience. <laughs> yes, and John, thank you for some great uh, resources you're sending. He should be on the panel. He he thinks about this stuff and very, very intelligently and great person to talk to. <laughs> um, so there was a question that came in and, and a second, so I think this will be of a lot of interest. Um, are you aware of any public facing worksheets, writing prompts, et cetera, that help a person walk through the questions that facilitate regular individual reflection? Yes. Uh, there is a wonderful resource. Um, I will actually just put it in the chat. I think it's failforward.org. Could be failforward.com if I'm not mistaken. Um, the woman that runs Fail Forward, Ashley Good, is um, worked for many years in Engineers Without Borders, and she ran up against many of the same sorts of issues that we're talking about here today, structurally you know, with systems and also with mindsets and just not feeling like the community was really grappling with this very effectively. Um, she started her own consulting firm, Fail Forward, and it is specifically designed to help organizations think through how to be more effective at learning from failure. She has a resources page that includes um, 
I think really valuable discussion prompts and worksheets for thinking through how do we get from single loop learning to double loop learning, for example, and is there a way that we can assess how well our organization is tackling these topics. So I would encourage you all to, to check that out. Um, I have some other resources. Again, I'd be happy to share through Sarah to the wider group um, after we're done. Um, there is, again, just increasingly um, more and more material available for people who do wanna try to work on this in their organizations. Um, and again, I just, I just wanna reiterate that we can start small, like get your team together, talk about doing a pause and reflect and set aside some time to ask yourself, what did we learn? What's your thinking about what we've learned? How does this integrate with what we have experienced in other contexts? What does this mean for what we need to do differently going forward? I can't stress enough the value of taking just a little bit of time to do that on a regular basis and run it as an experiment. Um, look up a few questions on how to do a debrief. The, Google is full of them. And make sure that your project does not end without having a, a proper debrief. Um, there's, again, some resources on Fail Forward about, uh, I think she calls it a mid-mortem. So you may have heard of a pre-mortem, which is a tool that is very valuable and extremely underused. I highly recommend that people go and have a look at how to do a pre-mortem. You may also want to do a mid-mortem. Again, look at Ashley's resources on that. And then your post-mortem, which is something we've all heard about. But I challenge you, how many of you have actually done a very effective pre-mortem? And what, uh, sorry, post-mortem. And what is an effective post-mortem anyway? Did we just get around and sit around and talk about it? Or did we try to actively say, we learned this thing and it will change how we do something like this in the future? And then as you're going into the planning phase for that next iteration, is someone responsible for saying, hey, we learned this thing the last time. Let's make, let's discuss that. Does, is that relevant here? So I, I challenge you to bring that learning to life. That will get me off on a whole nother tangent, which is learning is alive. Documenting something and sticking it on a shelf and saying, oh, I just had a learning process. That's not a learning process. A learning process is pulling it back off the shelf. How do, you, how do you talk about it with people? How do you share that experience? How do you change your mental model, either of yourself or of the group you're working with to reflect that you have generated new knowledge and ultimately new wisdom when you have turned it into something that will affect how you do things in the future? Okay, close parentheses. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Allison. And we have so many good questions. Uh, I want to add, um, we're going to switch gears a tiny bit. I wonder, this question, I wonder if your work explored how different cultural contexts impact views of failure, i.e. non-Western, and if this is useful for the field of conservation to explore. Yes. Um, I only touched on it very briefly, um, but I acknowledge that that is an incredibly important area for research and more importantly, understanding. So when I was going through, for anyone out there who's done a PhD, you may have gone through that experience where you cast a really wide net. And then in order to get your PhD done, you actually have to shrink that net down to something that's manageable in the time period that you have available. For a couple of months, I went down some very, very interesting um, I won't call them rabbit holes because that makes it sound like it's a really small thing. I will say I went into uh, exploring some of the literature, some of the research, some of the practice around cultural um, differences in learning and learning from failure and approaching this uh, topic um, in different ways. I think an entire PhD or multiple PhDs could be done on exactly that topic. And I am very open to knowing if anybody out in the audience um, has some has done some research on that or has run across some research on that. I did not get to examine it fully. I only know that from the limited amount that I did examine, 
there are some important considerations. A lot of this came out, especially in the 250 plus interviews that I did with people um, where they said, oh, I've been, I was working in this context, which is very different than a white Western context. And these were the sorts of interactions that we had. And these were some of the challenges that we had in, um, in having these discussions. So I think there's a rich vein there. I just didn't get to explore it, unfortunately. Okay, thank you, Allison. Moving back there, people are specifically interested in, can you, um, in government processes, um, so this question, I'm interested in hearing of examples where a culture of reflection on failure has been incorporated into government processes. The examples you've provided relate to private regulatory or NGO situations where work is driven by project or regulatory, e.g. safety outcomes. Mm -hmm. But government function has numerous and unique types of failure, including political failure, which can contribute to a risk adverse culture. Sure. Well, I will give you a couple, yes. Again, another enormous topic. Um, let me give you a couple of examples on government agencies or quasi agencies that I think have led the way in this work. USAID has tackled this head on. They have a wealth of resources on pause and reflect um, and in sort of intentional learning resources. Uh, again, I can point you to, or some, maybe somebody can Google it real quick, but the USAID toolbox on uh, CLA, they call it, Collaborate, Learn, and Adapt. I believe it was a multi-year contract that they uh, funded to really develop uh, best practices in how you learn. And of course, that encompasses learning from failure. How do you set up systems to encourage reflection? How do you work with their, what they call their implementing partners to um, encourage them to do some experiments, to try different things, to report on what's not working, to you know more than one, um, to try to, to go to the, where their implementing partners are working, encourage them to try different things and report on the results to those, not just back to the headquarters, but to other implementing partners as well so that that learning can get shared. So I would just highlight USAID as an, a quasi organiza uh, governmental organization. Typically, we might think of them as being very bureaucratic and very entrenched, but they really have put a lot of time, effort and money into tackling this problem. The other government uh, agency that I would encourage people to look up and, um, and explore that many people here may be familiar with is the, um, the fire service. So the sort of the national way that we tackle fires, um, whether it be on the national scale or the state scale. I think that is in response to the nature of the work that they do. So it could also be in response to the, where they draw their pool of employees from. I'm not sure. I know that there is not an insignificant number of former military people in the fire service, for example. And the incident reporting system that governs them is very akin to sort of military style of command and control and debriefing and after action reports and things like that. But from people that I interviewed uh, in the fire service, they take learning from failure very seriously. Again, probably because if they don't, people die. So the consequences of not examining these kinds of issues are immediate and dire. I do agree that broadly speaking, I'm not sure that government agencies, and I'm reluctant to name names here, but there are government agencies that are less open to this thing, this, this, this way of thinking. And I don't have the answer for how to change that. My experience being in the military is that each of us will have different times in our work professional lives where we are working with people who are more open to these ideas and people who are less open to these ideas. That book, um, 
Originals by Adam Grant has a good example of a woman working in a governmental, very bureaucratic organization. And she had some suggestions on different ways of doing things and how we can learn better. She was not successful in getting that organization to change until there was a turnover in people and new people came in who were more open to these ideas. So I guess my answer to that question is don't give up but also be aware that the context and the environment in which you're working may be more or less conducive to some of the things that we're talking about here today. And that's just the nature of people and organizations. Okay, thank you, Allison. And I wanted to give everyone on just sort of a, a warning heads up or invitation. I think we're gonna explore some of these questions that have come up on some of uh, Octo's uh, listservs, uh, MPA help and EBM help over the coming weeks, months. Uh, so if you're interested in those discussions, um, uh, maybe you're on the, the listservs or not, if, if you, um, I'll put my email if, if you're interested in joining them for the purposes of participating in those discussions, um, I can send you information on how to get on uh, and post it. Um, this is sort of really put you on the spot. There was a question, can you name some current examples where fear of failure is causing negative outcomes on a large scale? Come on guys, there's 129 people in here and somebody can't come up with an example. <laughs> Um, I'm tempted to say um, climate change, but I haven't really unpacked that enough to be articulate about that at the moment. Um, no, I don't have a good example right now. Okay. That's something that I think would be interesting to think a little bit more about and hear from some people about and kind of wrestle with that a little bit. Um, anyone? Anyone? No? Nobody has anything there? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a great question. I don't have an answer for that right now. Okay, no problem. There was another question I wanted to uh, move up to. Let me go, let's got to scroll up for it. Uh, I've got to find, there are lots of good ones, but there's one I'd sort of Tagged. It's an imperfect system for finding the questions again. Oh, okay. On the subject of conservation objectives, do you think people are more likely to come together and agree on failure, where they don't want to end up, how they don't want to proceed, than what one does, than what success for a project will look like and how to get there? Do you think starting from a place of agreement on what you don't want can foster improved collaboration on a conservation project? Yes. I do think there's value there. That almost sounds like a pre-mortem. So I think, and I'd love to hear from other people what their experiences are, but I've certainly experienced people coming together at the beginning of a project and doing a lot of planning. And a lot of it is focused on, if we do this, this, and this, we're gonna be successful. And relatively little time on what are the risks? What if we, what if we don't, meet this objective that is an interim objective on the way to our goal, then what do we do? I find this is particularly relevant when multiple stakeholders are involved and it's really hard to get everybody together to agree on a thing. And then when that when change is necessitated by events that have occurred, it's really, really hard to get all those stakeholders to then agree to that pivot. So I don't have a good answer for that other than at the beginning, setting up an expectation that change is expected, that adaptation is required. So yeah, I think that that pre-mortem process, that process of examining what could go wrong, as well as what are the things that we need to do to make things you know, successful is part of the fullness of the conversation that needs to happen and it's often missing. Okay, thank you, Allison. Sure. And we are out of time with still a ton of great questions we weren't able to get to. But again, I hope we can uh, follow up in uh, on our discussion list. Um, also, I will be sit, I'll send out, I'll compile all the um, resources that were sent around, uh, sort of try and rejigger and put like things together um, and send that out to you guys. So 
don't worry about not being able to record all the chat. Uh, Somebody, that'll go out how they could save the chat. There's three little buttons next to the smiley thing. And if you click that, there's a little save chat button. And then you, you can say show in folder and it'll stick it somewhere in your documents anyone's interested. I'm always interested in talking about this stuff. Um, and so if anyone has wants to talk about it more, um, please feel free to reach out to me and we can talk more about it. <laughs> I think it's endlessly fascinating. Um, not just because it's an interesting topic, but because it's really important for how effectively we can do our work. And it's totally underexamined. Um, absolutely. And Allison, thank you so much for coming on to talk about this. We so appreciate it. Um, and thank you to John for the tip that we should have Allison on. Uh, John Thanks, Fisher's John. Done <laughs> great webinars for us, and uh, we appreciate um, him linking us, uh, letting us know about your work, and we appreciate you being willing to come on, and we will appreciate your further engagement on this topic. So, absolutely. Uh, Thanks, th everybody. Yes, and thank you to everyone who participated in the chat and sent questions in, and thank you for coming. Um, and we will follow up with everyone with uh, resources and, and further discussion. Okay, thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day.